Hello, my name is Raymond Hughes, and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. Today's date is the 15th of July, 2015. And we have the pleasure and honor today of interviewing Staff Sergeant James E. Lyles, veteran of the Vietnam War. And uh, you prefer to be called Jim or James? Jim, yeah. Jim. Jim, if you would, we get a little biographical information first. Uh, where, where were you born and grew up at? Uh, I was born at um, Spears Hospital in Dayton, Kentucky, but I grew up in Newport. I see. And when were you born? What was your birth date? August 5th, 1947. I see. And, uh, and you grew up where? Newport. Oh, in Newport. New Newport, Kentucky. I see. And uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, Jim? Uh, my father, his name was Corey Lyles, and my mother's name was Dorothy Farmer, and then Lyles, and then she was married twice after that. I see. And what did your uh, father do for a living? Uh, he was pretty much, uh, when he got out of the Army, he was in World War II. He worked in a, in a machine shop uh, someplace over here in Cincinnati, and then I think American Tool. Mm -hmm. And then later on, he when I was growing up, he was a bartender. And then uh, Where at? Uh, down at Three Brothers Cafe at uh, 8th and Isabella mm -hmm. in Newport. And then he bought a, a, a bar out in Wilder. It was called Coy and Betty's. That was his wife at the time, Betty. Mm -hmm. I see. And what, uh, what schools did you go to, Jim? Um, I went to the grade school, uh, Arnold School and um, 10th Street which was like a small elementary school that only went to the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Then back to Arnold and then uh, Fourth Street Junior High and then Newport High School. And I graduated in um, June of 1965. I see. Um, did you have any uh, brothers and sisters? I have a sister, Sandy. She's two years, two years younger than me. And I had a half brother, uh, Rusty Crowder, and he's, uh, he's deceased. I see. Uh, and what did you do after you graduated from high school? Well, two weeks after I graduated, I went into the Army. I was 17 years old, uh, and uh, I had my mom sign for me. So I'd actually signed up, like, back in February to go in. I see. And uh, where did you sign up at, and uh, where did you go to basic first? Uh, signed up in Cincinnati. Well, actually, to the recruiter in Newport, but they brought us over to Cincinnati to swear us in and uh, actually went in with another guy from Newport by the name of Rick Furnish. So we went on the buddy plan. So we were guaranteed to stay together for, for basic training. And uh, we went to Fort Knox for basic training. Now Fort Knox for basic training, is that for uh, armor or infantry? Yeah, it was or? armor then, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a home of armor, but they were doing a lot of basic training there. I see. And after basic, uh, what happened? Then I went home on leave for a couple of weeks and went to um, uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, back the first time I'd ever been on a plane, and uh, for uh, advanced individual training that was heavy weapons infantry. And what do you mean by heavy weapons? Uh, like uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, like uh, 106 recoilless rifle, which is like a, a straight projectile uh, weapon that that's sets on a jeep uh -huh. and it has like a 35 pound uh, uh, round and uh, also the uh, 90 90 recordless and actually I actually qualify with the bazooka but they they weren't using them when I when I got out of that training I see was your friend still with you in the training no no <clears throat> he went to the 173rd well he went to AIT and then he went to the 173rd airborne I see so uh, after the uh, Fort Dix, did you say? Fort Dix, New Jersey, yeah. yeah. Then I actually was supposed to go to jump school at Fort Benning, but they were full, so they sent us to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, assigned to the 101st Airborne, uh, which the 101st Airborne now is airmobiles, so they're not all paratroopers. But at that time, everyone was a paratrooper. So it's kind of rough because if you weren't a paratrooper, they called you legs. So there was about seven of us and they just harassed the heck out of us because we weren't airborne qualified. So we had to stay there about uh, probably four, four or five weeks and then they, 
they bussed us down to Fort Benning for jump school. We were there for 17 days. Came back to Fort Campbell. That time we were airborne qualified, so. Okay. So uh, were you assigned to a division or regiment at that time? I was with the 506. Uh, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. 506, uh, yeah, infantry, yeah. yeah. And how long did you stay down there? At, uh, um, I was probably there for about three months. Uh, the, the whole division was pretty much in Vietnam. So there wasn't too many people at Fort Campbell. So most of the time we were doing guard duty and KP and far watch and uh, just different things that we didn't do much training. And uh, me and a, a friend of mine that I actually met when I was sworn in at Cincinnati. His name was Harold Kimbrey. We called him Dusty. That was his nickname. Uh, we were together through basic training and AIT and Fort Campbell and jump school. So now we're back at Fort Campbell and we're going into the captain. We'd go in and see the captain every week. And uh, I think we just made PFC. And we said, look, we want to go to Vietnam. The, the 101st is in Vietnam. Why don't you send us to Vietnam? So that went on for about probably three or four weeks. And Finally, one day the captain calls us down. He said, well, you guys are going to Vietnam. We said, good, good. He said, but before you go, you're going up to uh, Fort Lewis with the 4th Infantry. He said, uh, the whole division's gearing up to go to Vietnam and they're grabbing people from all over the, all over the world. And uh, I looked at the captain. I said, you can't send me to a leg unit. And he goes, he looks at his bars and he looks at my shoulder, my PFC stripe. He said, yes, I can. He said, you've been bugging the heck out of me to go to Vietnam, you, you guys. And he said, you're going, but you're going up to the 4th Infantry. So I wound up being shipped up to Fort Lewis, Washington. The 4th Infantry actually, pretty much the whole division, uh, went through basic training, uh, advanced individual training, basic unit training, and advanced unit training. You went and through all that again? No, no. no when no. I got to oh. Fort Lewis, they were probably in the second week of the basic unit training. So you joined in their training with right. the fourth. Right. Now they would, if I remember correctly, the fourth had the eighth and the twelfth and the twenty second. Yeah, I was uh, with the first the C Company first and the twenty second. I see. And uh, how long did you stay up there uh, in Washington State? Uh, I probably got there in um, April. Coldest place I've ever been. April of uh, sixty um, six. six. Uh -huh. Yeah, coldest place I've ever been. Uh, when we first went out on bivouac, they'd give us sleeping bags, which were great if it's cold. And then they took them away and said, take your poncho, put your blanket on it, and it folded over and it's like a sleeping bag. No, it's not. It's freezing. And we had canteens that were frozen with water and they wouldn't let us start a fire. And you know, you can't start fires in Vietnam. And I'm like, how can I train for Vietnam when it's a hundred and something degrees and it's like 20 below zero here, which probably wasn't that cold, but it felt like it. Mm -hmm. But I was actually assigned as a um, gunner on a 106 recoilless rifle when I was at Fort Lewis. I see. And um, w was Dusty still with you there? Yes, he was. He was actually a gunner on a 106 in the other squad. There were two, two squads in a heavy weapons infantry unit. And the, uh, the, the company commander, uh, he was a West Point captain, Captain Cuker, great guy. We worked real close with him because he used our unit is the bad guys. So uh, like C company or A company would be out on, on like, a, a, like a search and destroy thing and we would play the bad guys. We would do the ambushes and I'd climb up in trees and we had blanks and we'd shoot at them and we'd set up different things. Like I'd put somebody low in a tree and, 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 and they're trying to get to him and I'm up there shooting about eight other people, you know, but, but we had a lot of fun doing that, playing the bad guys. I see. And how long did you stay up there in Washington then? Um, we got up there in about April and we left to go to Vietnam around July 20th. Um, actually, we went over on, um, on a ship called the General Nelson M. Walker. It was a merchant marine ship, but they used it to transport uh, troops. Where'd you leave from? We left from uh, Tacoma, Tacoma, Washington. Yeah. And did you stop anywhere on your way to Vietnam? Um, they stopped in Okinawa overnight, but we weren't allowed off. I think the officers went and some of the guys had jumped overboard, but we stayed on board. Now, yeah. when you're assigned to the to the 4th Division 22nd Regiment, are you still wearing your uh, jump insignia? Yes. Yeah. But you're wearing a 4th Division patch? Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
So uh, you stopped, uh, what, one, one night, you say, at, at Okinawa? Mm -hmm. And from there... And we went to, landed in uh, Quenyon, Vietnam. And you were still on the, uh, the Walker, the yeah. ship, merchant actually, ship? I actually landed, landed on my birthday. Uh, you know, I read in the books and they say we landed on August 6th. Well, we probably got off the ship on the 6th, but we landed on the 5th because that was my birthday. And it was funny because I think about three days before that, I got KP. And we're all like dreading KP, but when and me and Dusty both got KP. And when we get down there, it's like, great. We've got all the food we can eat. We're slicing lunch meat and we're eating these big sandwiches, submarine sandwiches. They had real milk. So I went the next, that next night, I went to the list, saw the guy with KP, and I went up to him. I said, look, and, 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 and the guy that Dusty, uh, two of them, and we said, man, it's terrible. It's hot down there. They work your, your butts off, but we've done it once. So we know how to do it. So if you give us like five bucks, which that's probably a lot of money back then, we'll do your KP for you. So we did, we did the KP actually three days. It was, it was great duty, you know. Get all the desserts you wanted to. Oh yeah, to. it was cool down there. I mean, it was cool, you know, where we were at, it was burning up hot. It was cool down there. So mm -hmm. we actually did KP three days because we tricked these other guys thinking it was, it was a really hard job, but it wasn't. Now, Dusty went through all the same training, basically, that you did, yes, he did. in the Airborne and then transferred up to the right. Fourth Division. And you two guys got off at, where at in Vietnam? When you uh, got Quinn Yon. Quinn Yon. Yeah. And uh, if you would, uh, I'll let you continue the narration from here on out then, now that we've, uh, we've entered Vietnam on August the, August the 5th, 5th and, and got off the ship the next day. Yeah. And we thought it was kind of funny because I think when you, you think about when I'm in Vietnam now and you're, you're wanting your weapon and you're thinking that somebody's going to be shooting at you, but that didn't happen. Quinn Yon was pretty secure. And what they did is they, once they got everybody off the ship, they sent the rest of the battalion um, up to Play Coup. That's where our base camp was going to be up in the highlands in Play Coup. And our company, C Company, was the honor company. So they kept us back, and then the next day, uh, they took they took us and put us on a landing craft, and they took us out. And we circled around a couple times, and we come back on. And when the ramp came down, we marched out with the guys with the flags in front. And uh, in fact, there's a, a time life uh, segment uh, of the buildup in Vietnam, and there, I can actually pick out Dusty and me coming off that ramp landing craft. I have a copy of it at home. But anyway, we come out and then we all lined up and General Westmoreland came up and gave us a big speech. And then the next day they shipped us up to play coup. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, pretty much it was just, it was just. Uh, what was play coup? It was just a big lot. I mean, there was a city play coup, but well, I never really got there. But this was just like, like forest and, and fields. And they had the, um, the first cavalry division kind of securing the area. So we started like digging, digging bunkers and and uh, and, uh, and making making a perimeter uh, around the base camp and and some of the people you know like rank people had tents. Uh, we pretty much had pup tents that we made out of our two ponchos that we put together and then two guys would would sleep together. And uh, the first night there, um, which actually I hadn't got there yet because I was still down in Quinion. Um, a guy wound up shooting his friend in the head with a 45, supposedly unloading it, and they wound up they wound up um, moving our company commander, which I, I, I just hated that because the guy was just such a great leader, and uh, I, you know he wound up later on going to A Company and, and wound up getting wounded really bad. I mean he got overran, wound up crawling underneath some leaves, and and and, and they missed him, and, and he he's. Uh, at least he's still alive, as far as I know. Captain Kicker is, but but it was kind of like it's like things were were messed up. We had one of our first patrol a guy went out and he had grenades on his on his Alice suspenders and he, he had the pin straightened out. And one of the grenades popped off and and wound, didn't kill anybody. Wounded a couple people and I'm like, man, this is this is really crazy. What's going on here? So we were there probably about two weeks in play coup. And then they sent the first of the 22nd down to the coast of Tuiwa. And uh, pretty much they were, um, we were there to 
to keep the, the Viet Cong, which was Viet Cong there, to, from getting rice because it was kind of like going in the, the rice harvest down in Tuiwa. In Tuiwa, I was assigned as a gunner on a 106, and they assigned, uh, so there were four of us on the Jeep. There was the sergeant and the driver and the gunner and the assistant gunner, and they assigned us to a water purification point. So it was right off of Highway 1, which was the only highway there, and, and Tuiwa, and we were kind of out in the, in the boonies. We weren't near the city, and we weren't, there was, it was near the coast, but we weren't really by the coast. And uh, so we secured the water point, which was right near the river. And uh, there was about four or five engineers there uh, that we worked with. And didn't have too much action. Uh, the first night I was there, they put me on, um, they had a big bunker with a, with a 50 caliber machine gun. And, they, and the engineer said, this is great. We got four more people. We don't have, you get, we get a little bit more sleep now. I think there was four or five engineers. So the first night out, I'm, I'm at the bunker and, and, and I, I hear this shot. And I'm, in a, you know, I'm looking across the river and I'm like, and then I saw a muzzle, muzzle flash, flash on the other side of the river. And, uh, and I heard the round go over and I was like, oh man. So I, I went around to the tent where the engineers were. They had a big tent there right next to the 50 caliber machine gun bunker. And I was yelling, Sarge, Sarge, get up, they're shooting at us, they're shooting at us. So I've only been, been in Vietnam like a week, maybe, maybe a week and a half. And uh, I'm waiting for him to come out and I'm carrying a 45 because that's what a gunner carried on a, on a 106 recoilless rifle. Later on, I got an M16, I got smart. And uh, so I'm waiting for him and all of a sudden, I see somebody from the edge of the bunker running, and, and, and they got no shirt on and no hat, no shoes. I'm like, Viet Cong. So I yell, halt, and I pull out my, my pistol and I shoot. And at the same time I fired, I was diving behind these barrels, which turned out later to be gasoline barrels. But anyway, I knew I missed, because I knew he had went behind the tent. And I was like, oh, shoot. So I get my 45 and I go around the other side of the tent waiting to run into this guy, and it turns out it's a sergeant. He went out the back of the tent to the bunker, was looking around, didn't see anything, and he ran back, and that's when I saw him. So lucky, luckily, I missed, and the next day we found the round. It was, there was a truck back there, and it went to the door, went to the battery box, and stuck in the battery. And he had about 60 days left in country, so he took that bullet out and made a necklace out of it. And he said, I'm going to wear that until I get out of here. So I was like, thank God you don't. I didn't, it didn't hit you. The only good thing about it is my platoon sergeant always got me and my friend Dusty mixed up, you know, because we both had big nose, I guess. And, and every time he'd see Dusty, he'd say, I can't believe you shooting at your own men, you know. So I kind of got, got off of that, even though I felt bad about it, but it was like, you know, thank God I missed a guy. But I mean, they didn't really give us much training as far as like the people, you know, um, which I think later on they started doing that, you know, giving you some language skills and things, but they never really told us much about the, the population. So uh, I pretty much seen somebody running and I knew I'd, somebody was shooting at me and I see a guy with no shirt on and, and bare feet, I'm thinking it's a Viet Cong, you know. Mm -hmm. So we stayed there and, and there was a couple little skirmishes where they, they'd snipe at us at night. And uh, at one time they said there was a whole battalion headed our way and we set up trip flares. I fact, actually, took a raft and floated across the river at midnight and set up trip flares. And, and uh, they wound up hitting the Korean division up the river and they didn't, didn't come our way because shoot, there was only 10 of us. We'd have been gone or you know, about nine or 10. So we stayed there for probably, um, I would say, so about the end of September. And then they moved us up to Kantum, which was in the highlands of Vietnam, pretty much jungle and uh, pretty much going to run into the NVA. And what we would do is we go out <clears throat> for about two weeks, sometimes three weeks, the company would. And, and what they do, they bring us in and, they, and, and it was usually like fire bases that had been used at one time. But, you know, they had filled the holes in and everything. And I don't know if it was from the French or if it was from who it was from, but anyway, we dig our perimeter and dig the foxholes and then they'd set up some tents and they'd bring in the artillery. So we'd stay there about four or five days and uh, guard duty every night, eat and see rations. And then after about four or five days, they'd send uh, one company like west, one east, one north and one south. And we'd go out for two weeks or three weeks and the whole company, which was 
supposed to be like 150 people, but most times it was 80 or 90, sometimes 100, but not that many. But you had guys that were getting malaria and guys that were getting wounded and, and guys doing different things. And we'd go out on search and destroy missions. And uh, pretty much we went about three months and we didn't, we, we saw some activity where they had been there like bamboo shoots where they'd been eating. Once we went up this mountain and we found like a, a temporary hospital where they had some bloody bandages and stuff there. But except for some sniping at night um, and a, a mortar round once in a while, we didn't see much activity. But the thing is, you, you, you're going out for two or three weeks, you're not changing clothes, you're not taking your boots off, you're eating sea rations, which isn't a staple diet. Every night, two guys dig a foxhole and you, you carry sandbags on your pack, which weighs 75, 80 pounds anyway. And you fill the sandbags up and you put them around the hole and then you cut down some trees and small logs and put them over top of it and put, put sandbags on top. And then they put two guys in the hole. You got to, one of them's got to stay awake. Well, you can't go, well, Ray, you stay awake four hours, and Jim, you stay awake four hours. You can't stay awake that long. You're tired. You're, you're humping the hills all night. It's 100 degrees. You got leeches crawl, crawling on you all the time. And it's it just it's the way you live. You, you're not changing clothes. It's, it's terrible hot. Snakes. So you stay awake like an hour at a time, sometimes two hours. So, you know, you stay awake an hour, I, then I sleep. And then you wake me up, and I stay awake an hour. And then you're standing there looking and you start seeing things move and it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's like, uh, I, I guess it's nice because you're not getting shot at, but the stress of the fact that you know you're going to get shot at. And early on, I thought, how in the world can you be on search and destroy when you got a hundred guys chomping through the jungle and at night you're chopping down trees and every three days you got helicopters coming over, dropping sea rations and water and and a lot of times we'd go a whole day without water, which was terrible because you were so thirsty. I remember one time we, we hadn't had water for about a day and a half. And, uh, and actually I was with Dusty then because uh, once we were in the jungle, I wasn't on the 106 anymore. And Dusty went to 2nd Platoon as an infantryman and I went out as a forward observer. So I was like uh, calling mortar rounds if we got hit. That's what I was supposed to be doing. We found this rotted tree stump and had some water in it. It was like, it looked like it come out of the Licking River, but we were drinking it, you know. But you could get, um, your parents and, and your friends would send you grape Kool-Aid and you'd fill up your canteen and put that grape Kool-Aid in there, mainly because of the, of the malaria tablets, or, or not malaria tablets, but chlorine tablets that you had mm -hmm. to put in your canteen. The water was just terrible. I mean, it was almost like drinking Clorox, but you could put grape Kool-Aid in there. I, I can't drink grape Kool-Aid today. I just I can't drink it. And I liked it back then, but uh, but it's just the way you had to live. It was just like, you know, you're out there and then you come back in to the base camp and there'd be a stream there. Uh, they didn't have showers and we'd go down in the stream and we, we'd wash up and then they'd be, have a big pile of clothes and you'd take your clothes off and change your clothes. I remember once we, we'd come back and it was Sunday and we changed, washed up and changed clothes and they had church service and we went up to the church service and one of the guys that was with us came down and sat next to us. And we were like, man, whew, get out of here. You stink. And I mean, I probably smelled just like him before that, you know. But <laughs> I guess since I got cleaned up, I, I, I noticed that I was clean and he was stinking, you know. Yeah. So I told him, get out of here. So that went on for probably, I guess, September uh, up until February, uh, going out every two, two or three weeks, coming back. Didn't run into a whole lot, so I guess I was lucky in, in that respect. Uh, a couple times while we, sometimes we'd stay back at base camp because somebody had to guard the base camp while the other companies went out. And we, we'd get a couple little far fights, you know, which pretty much they'd come up two or three of them and they would shoot. And, and then we'd shoot back and then we'd go looking for them and we wouldn't find them. But, and once in a while they wounded a couple guys. Uh, my friend Dusty, a, a funny story about him, <clears throat> he was from Cincinnati and he was going out on a listening post. Well, at night, right when it was getting dark, they would send out like somebody north, south, east, and west, two guys usually. And you'd go out about 100, 200 yards and then you'd find some bushes to hide under and you had a radio. And the idea was if, if the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army guys, tried to come in and sneak up on you, they'd be like an advance warning, you know. Mm -hmm. And hopefully 
the guys that were the enemy would pass them by or they could either either if they saw like maybe 50 or something of them ahead they could get back in real fast well dusty and this other guy they go out about 20 30 feet into the jungle and it's it, not quite dark where we're at but once you get into the the triple canopy it's real dark and they run into two or three nva guys and they get in a little far fight so they come running back in and uh, we go over there and uh, they're all excited yeah we saw three guys and they were you know they were shooting at us and we go back out somebody had a little pin light and they saw some blood but we didn't find anybody so dusty has to go back out all night with this guy so i didn't see him the next day because usually if you're out all night you get to you get to sleep the next day but the next day i saw him he comes over to me and he's licking his lips and i'm going he's going man that was really good you get, I got, got any chili on me and i'm like what are you talking about chili? where'd you get chili at he said, yeah, I just went over to and it was some restaurant that he went to in Cincinnati. I don't, I can't remember. I, I keep saying Little Mexico, but I know that they, they wouldn't sell cheese coney. He said, yeah, I, I just had me a cheese coney and uh, a three-way. He said, man, it was delicious. And he kept working his lips, and I'm like, hmm. So then the next time I seen him, he started talking about he had been to the drive-in with this, his girlfriend. And he's telling me all about the movie he saw. I mean, serious as he can be. And he's like sweating real bad, and I'm like, man. So I was real good friends with the chaplain and because uh, he had baptized me at base camp on Christmas Day. So I went to the chaplain and I said, my buddy Dusty, I said, he's flipped out. And I told him about the incident, you know, on the listening post. I said, you got to go talk to him and get him some help. He's flipped out. So he goes down and talks to him and he comes back. He said, yeah, I'm sending him back to be evaluated. So he goes back to the to uh, play coup where our base camp was at, which was starting to get built up at that time. And it turns out he's got malaria. He's running at like 105 temperature. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh. So I thought he flipped out where he had malaria. So, so he had to put up with that. So, so anyway, on February the 16th, 1967, uh, we we left our base camp, uh, C Company, and we were going out for a couple of weeks. On the, the first day we were going out, we probably got about uh, maybe four miles, I guess, maybe three. Usually you do like about a five mile radius. You, you, you kind of go this way and come back and then the other company goes this way and comes back. So you're kind of covering all, you know, everything that's out there. And uh, a company who had went out the other way, they got hit real hard and they're calling for help. Well, we're about maybe a mile, mile and a half away from them where we were at. So we started cutting through the jungle um, with with machetes and I mean, it was really thick. I mean, it was, it, I felt like I was running, but yet I know I wasn't because uh, it would take us so long to cut through the jungle. And you can only do that for about five minutes and you're completely worn out, you know, especially when you're in a hurry. Uh, but anyway, a company supposedly got hit by 200 North Vietnamese guys. So when we got close to a company, uh, I was up in the front, I was actually, uh, the lieutenant was up in the front and um, he he wanted he needed a radio. So I said, well, you can use my radio, but I'm not carrying it because that's 25 extra pounds. I said, if you're going to use it, you know, uh, you're going to have to have somebody carry it. So he had somebody else carrying the radio, but we're right up in the front and we're, we were on this trail in single file and this helicopter came over and they started shooting at it. So he stops the column the lieutenant does. He's a new guy. I don't re remember his name. And he stops and he grabs me. He says, wow, let's go, uh, go to the uh, right. And he grabbed this guy named Stonebreaker. And he said, you go straight. And he goes, other guy, go to the left. Well, we're going to do this cover and movement. And, and what the way they teach in the Army is you run from three to about three seconds because they said it takes four seconds for a guy to get a beat on you. So you actually run and then you hit the ground and then you start firing and you yell for the other guy. I'll cover you move. And it's like a leap, leapfrog thing. So you're running up three seconds and hitting the ground, running up three seconds. So we got about maybe 30 or 40 feet and uh, we heard somebody yelling for us. And they said, get back here, get back here. So we get back up and uh, we go back and a company commander was there. His name was uh, Captain uh, McManus. And he was brand new, first time, first time with our company. And I had never even met the guy. It was the first time I saw him when he came up there and his first day in the field. And uh, he starts chewing out the lieutenant. He said, you keep everybody together. You're not putting anybody out there by theirself. Because if we would have went out about another 40 or 50 yards, we would have 
we'd have been dead. There's no doubt in my mind. He saved our lives by bringing, bringing us back. So we get back on file and we go about another, maybe 20 feet past where, where we had leapfrogged. And I saw two NVA guys running and me and Sergeant Apo, who was next to me, we fired, um, I fired about six rounds and he fired about four or five. And uh, they were running and we, we were kind of going and I don't know if we hit them or not. And then all of a sudden, just everything, bullets were just hitting everything. I jumped behind this tree. I could see the lieutenant about eight foot away. He was behind a tree. And the trail was probably about where that desk is at, probably about 10 feet away. And uh, I hear the lieutenant yelling, somebody get the captain, somebody get the captain. I look out and I see the captain laying in the trail. Well, I'm sure what happened was, since he's supposed to be in the middle of the column, when we stopped again, he come running up to see what was going on, thinking, you know, I don't know, the lieutenant was doing something wrong again. And he got shot. And, and uh, he's yelling, get the captain, get the captain. So the bullets are chipping the tree where I'm at. So I threw my pack off. I had an M16. I threw it down. And I ran out. And I tried to pick him up. But he was like 6'5". He was too big. I couldn't pick him up. And there was another guy behind a tree. And he was reaching out. And he was trying to grab his, 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 uh, kick his pack and pull him. But he wasn't doing it because the guy was too heavy. So I got down on my knees. And I put my arms around the middle of his body. And I lifted him up. And, and I scoot him about, about a foot. And I thought, I'll scoot him over behind that tree and then a little, a little closer, this guy can help me. So I scooted up and I put my arms underneath him. I, and, I, and I did, I looked over to the left and I saw the ground jumping. The captain's back jumped and my leg, my, my right leg just flew around. And the captain turns out he got killed. He, he was still alive when I got to him because when I picked him up, he was moaning. And, uh, but, it, but he had some blood on his back, so I knew he got shot somewhere around the, around the shoulder area. So anyway, I got, I, I got back up and I got under again and I pulled him and this guy pulled him and we, get, we kind of drug half his body, you know, around that tree. And, uh, and I thought, you know what, I've been shot. So I looked and I really wasn't in any pain. It was, it was like amazing. I thought I'd be in a lot of pain. And... Uh, I looked down and I had a hole in my pants. So I ripped my pants and I got this big hole in my leg and I'm like, oh crap. And I took my field dressing off and I covered it and it didn't even cover. And those, those things were huge. It just never covered the whole, the whole area where I got shot. And, uh, and it seemed like about that time, like all the shooting stopped. Well, it turns out that these, there were five or six NBA guys in trees that were shooting at us. And, uh, and a couple guys with machine guns ran up and just blasted the trees. They were just, blasting each tree and they were they were shooting those guys out so the medic came up and he checked the checked the captain and he said no, he's gone and he, he put another bandage on my leg and then he put a stick i think he thought my leg was like in two pieces or something i don't know and they started moving in toward towards a company and i'm laying there and they're like everybody's walking past me and i'm like hey don't leave me so finally one guy reached down and I, I got up and I put my arm around his shoulder and we were hobbling and I was like, that, that, that stick was digging into my leg. So I reached down and I broke it and it like went right inside my wound. I was like, oh crap. So they took us and put us in a circle, which a company had already dug in. In fact, they were still digging. There was guys digging with helmets, you know, and there were still bullets coming in and every once in a while a grenade and, and anytime somebody in the perimeter, would, it was a tight perimeter, it wasn't very big. They would throw hand grenades. <clears throat> well, it turn, <clears throat> turns out A Company had 20 people killed in the initial ambush, and they had like 27 or 28 wounded, I'm not sure. We had one killed, which was the captain, and we had about, it was like 32 of us total wounded, so that'd be 20 times, so six of us were wounded. So they put us in a big pile, and still bullets coming and different things, and and uh, the guy, the medic's coming around with morphine, and I'm like, I don't need morphine. And it was funny because the pain that I had was like, you ever have your foot go to sleep? How that mm -hmm. tingles, you know? Yeah. It, well, it was like that, but it was like a thousand times more tingly than that. So it was good because it wasn't pain. And I said, no, don't, I don't want the morphine. Give it to this guy next to me, shot in the face. And I had a guy shot in the back. And uh, one guy, bullet went in here and came out of his mouth and knocked all his teeth out. Just, just really, I mean, you get 30, 32 wounded people. That's a lot of guys, Nineteen. you know? And, uh, so what they, what they did is they started chopping down trees uh, with machetes and, and, uh, I don't know if they had chainsaws, if they dropped chainsaws, I'm not sure, but I know they got an area cleared out 
and uh, they'd bring a helicopter and they'd lower, I mean, it's 300 feet in the air, they'd lower a cable with like a stretcher thing on a basket and they'd put a wounded guy in it and they'd pull him up. Well, they'd shoot at it. People would shoot back that way and sometimes a helicopter would take one guy and leave and then come back. Well, they took out about half of us, half of the wounded that night. So I laid there till the next day. I remember 14 hours total of laying in the jungle. And at one time my buddy Dusty came up and he said, man, are you, how are you doing? And I told him what happened to the captain. And, and he said, can I get you anything? And I said, I need an M16. They're gonna overrun us. Everybody thought we were gonna get overran. I said, they're gonna overrun us. I said, at least I'm gonna take some with me. So he come back a little bit later with an M16 and four or four or five magazines. So I'm like, I felt better then. I didn't, for some reason I wasn't scared. I don't know why, but I thought, well, if they're gonna overrun us, they're gonna overrun us. At least, you know, I could fight, go down fighting. So the, the next day, when it got daylight, they, they started bringing a helicopter and it, it wasn't too much shooting there. Once in a while, you could hear a round hit the chopper. <clears throat> so I'm the last guy out. They load me up in the basket and they're pulling me up and some way I'm, I'm like hallucinating and I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna get shot. It's gonna be in the stomach and it's not gonna kill me. I'm spinning around and I'm like tight in my stomach waiting to get shot in the stomach. I don't, don't ask me why I thought that, but. Anyway, they finally pulled me up and they banged my leg, get me in the bottom of the helicopter. It was one of those big uh, double-bladed Chinook helicopters. Mm -hmm. And they, they had like a little hole in the bottom of it and they drug me. And I crawled over and kissed the floor. And they got me back to the mass unit and play coup. And uh, of course I knew they were busy because they had all the other wounded guys ahead of me. But I kept hollering. I said, you know, they, they, they started taking my bandages off. And I said, you're not cutting my leg off. I said, I don't care what you do, you're not cutting my leg off. And about that time, one of the guys, the company clerks come over from, from headquarters and he goes, oh, not you, Lyles. I said, yeah, but I'm okay, you know. And they take the bandage off and he starts throwing up. And I'm like, oh. Then I really got excited. I said, you're not cutting my leg off. So this nurse settled me down. So they take me in and they give me a spinal. So I'm laying on my stomach, wide awake, and I can feel all this pulling. And I said, you're cutting my leg off. And I'm like really agitated. I said, you're, you're not cutting my leg off. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just constantly saying, you're not cutting my leg off. And I'd say, what are you doing now? And they'd say, we're operating on your leg. And, and I'd say, what are you doing now? You're not cutting my leg off. So finally I said, what are you doing? And the doctor said, we're taking the hamburger meat out. And if you shut up, I can get my work done. So I shut up after that. So they uh, took the hamburger meat out, I guess, and cleaned it up and they put a cast on. And uh, a couple of days later, they, they said I was going to Japan, but I wound up in Hawaii. So they operate on my leg. They um, put, had to do a skin graft because the wound was so big and they took some skin from up here and put it on my calf. And uh, I had to lay on my, on my back for 17 days. I couldn't turn over, I couldn't get out of bed. And then after 17 days, I could lay on my side, but I couldn't get out of bed for like, it was about 30, 32 or 33 days. I don't remember, something like that. So I couldn't even get out of bed for 30 something days. And then they said, well, you're gonna be on in a wheelchair for two or three weeks and on crutches for three or four weeks. So I was in a wheelchair for one day and I was on crutches for like two days. And when I got to where I could get around, I'd go to the different uh, places in the hospital looking for people that had been uh, with me that had got shot. And I found several of them. And in fact, one of them had told me that Kimberly, he was telling me guys who got killed and he said, Kimberly. And I said, oh, I said, Dusty? He goes, no, I don't know. Kimberly was his name. And uh, so I thought Dusty was dead. I thought, oh shoot, my best friend got killed, you know. I don't know why I didn't write a letter to somebody. I mean, I know I had the address, but I didn't. And uh, I wound up staying at the hospital probably about two and a half months. And then they shipped me back home. And, um, and, and when I was home, I, I met some girl in Hawaii from, she was from Louisiana. And when I was, was back home, she wound up coming there. And uh, we went over to Coney Island, which Coney Island was like the big Kings Island. And I'm walking with her and my sister and her, her boyfriend. And uh, I see this guy and he's walking with this girl. And I'm going like, that's Dusty. And I'm like, man, that must be his twin brother. And the closer he got, I'm like, geez, old piece, it looked just like him. And finally he looked over and saw me and he runs up and he starts hugging me. And I'm like, oh my God, I thought you were dead. And he, and he started naming off some guys. And I think there was a guy named Kimber that got killed, but not Kimberly something similar to his name. I was like shocked. 
Well, he was home on leave because he extended so he could get out of the army early. You know, we both had three years to stay in. So he, he wound up getting out like six months early, but he went back to Vietnam and was a gunner on a helicopter. Is that right? Yeah, in fact, he wound up pulling Rick Furnish into a helicopter when they were leaving. Um, Rick was with the 173rd, and Rick said, they, if they'd left me there, I'd have been dead. He said, Dusty pulled me in at the last minute. I thought that was amazing. You know, you know, hadn't seen him since basic training, and he pulls him out of the jungle. But, uh, but so I wound up going home on leave, and I went back to Fort Knox. Um, I had what, the, what happened? The, 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 I don't mean to interrupt you, but your girl, this girl from Hawaii came all the way to Newport? We wound up breaking up. Okay. She wanted to get married, and I didn't. I was only like 19, or okay. I didn't want to get married, so I just wound up finally telling her, you know, hey, I really care for you, but I'm just not ready to get married, and if you are, then so she left. She okay. wasn't too happy about it, but that's the way it was. But So you went down where? And I interrupted you. Where did you go from there? Uh, Fort Knox. I see. And uh, they signed me to a headquarters company of training, basic trainees. And pretty much what we did is the, the, the range that we worked on was called Herd Park. And we did, uh, we did uh, obstacle courses, um, cover and movement, field sanitation, and night patrol. Um, it, of course, back then, I don't know how it is now, but at the end of basic training, you go through a live fire exercise. And you crawl under barbed wire, and you go over logs, and you go over fences, and you low crawl, and you high crawl, and they're shooting a machine gun over your head, supposedly eight or 10 feet. But they say, they told us back then a, a low round could actually hit somebody if they stood up. So what we did on our course is we taught you how to low, low crawl, high crawl, how to go under barbed wire, you know, um, how to go over fences without exposing a lot of your body, how to crawl over logs, different things like that. And then we caught that, we taught that leapfrog cover movement. And at the end, everybody lined up and did an assault. And then we did field sanitation, you know, like dig a hole and, 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 and make sure you, you know, you cover it back up when you go to the bathroom and stuff. And, uh, and then we, we, we taught night patrol. And most of the guys that were going through night patrol were going to Vietnam. And uh, while I was stationed, I was an E-5. In fact, I got promoted to E-5 um, probably about a week before I got shot, but my orders hadn't come through. Because nice. uh, I, I got a letter that the lieutenant who took over the company, command, the company commander, first Lieutenant Jay Vaughn, and, and he said, Sergeant Lyles. And I'm like, because I hadn't even got my order yet, that I, I didn't even know I was a sergeant, you know. And, uh, and um, so then I was an E5, and then uh, I made E6 probably in April of 1968. And I was due to get out in, in June. I went in on June 28th, and I was going to get out June 27th. And I really liked the Army, uh, but the problem is I'm, I'm like 20 years old. Uh, I turned 21 the coming August. And all these guys that I'm working with, they're E6s and E7s, E8s. They've been busted 15, 20 times. Every one of them, I mean, I had guys in my room drinking alcohol at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they, they all smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, and I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. And I'm like, you know, if I stay in, I'm going to be like that. You know, and they didn't like me. Some of them didn't because I was gung-ho, and, and none, they had, none of them had been to Vietnam, and they, they were like, yeah, you know. But, I, you know, I did good. I made E6. It usually takes eight or nine years to make E6 when I was in. And I like training troops. In fact, I was on the range one day, and the, the general came out, and we had a colonel in charge of our company. And he was watching me run the class, and he told the, the colonel, he said, I really like that young staff sergeant. He said, how long has he got, how long has he been in the Army? And the lieutenant, of course, tells the colonel, well, he's going to be getting out in June. And this was like in, in uh, April. And... Uh, the lieutenant, according to the lieutenant, the general locked the colonel's heels and he said, I want that young staff sergeant re-enlisted. So they made me go to the re-enlistment guy like every week. He was drunk. Every time I go in, he was drunk. And the first thing he talked about is, well, if you stay in for six years, you can get $6,000. I was like, shoot, I'm a staff sergeant. I'm making um, $296 a month. And uh, you know, I don't need money. I mean, I got all the food I want, all the medical care. I think I was drawing $35 pro pay. That's a test you take on your MOS every year. Half the guys there couldn't even pass it. I guess they couldn't read, I don't know. But uh, the money wasn't a big thing for me. So uh, my lieutenant got talking to me and he says, um, he said, you know, 
you come right out of high school in the Army, and he said, you've really done good. He said, you ought to go to OCS. So I went back to the guy, and I said, I'm thinking about OCS. So he gets all the paperwork ready to go and stuff. And, and he said, well, you didn't score high enough. I said, okay, fine. So I went back, and Lieutenant said, take the test over. You're only 17 years old when you took it. So I took it over, and I scored plenty high enough. And, and then when I went to sign the papers, I kept thinking, you know what? I don't want to go back to Vietnam. I don't like the way they're fighting over there. And uh, so I said, no, I'm getting out. So I wound up getting out of the Army. And when did you get out? Yeah, June 27th, 1968. June 27th, 68. Yeah. I see. I mean, I like the Army, and I think I did good in it. And, and even to today, I can't, I don't know why I didn't get, like, in the, in the reserves. I don't know. I mean, I just got so many other things going. I got involved in martial arts, and I did that, you know, every almost every day for eight years, so. When did you start your martial arts training? Um, I actually started in 64, worked out till 65, went in the Army, came back and started back in 1970. You worked out under Bill Dimitri? Bill Dimitri, yep. Yeah, he, was, he was my instructor, my mentor. Um, he was a lieutenant at the time on the Covington Police Department, talked me into coming on the police department. I had actually worked 10 jobs from 68 to 76. And some of them a week, some three years, and I just, I just could not find a niche. And once I got on the police department, it was like, this is what I was meant to do. When did you, you know? go on the police department? Uh, September 27th, 1976. 1976, I see. Yeah. Now, uh, were you married at this time when you went on the police department? Uh, yes, uh -huh. I got married in 1970. I actually met my wife when I was in the Army. Um, that's a funny story because... Um, I saw her several times when I was, um, I didn't have my license at the time, and I was riding with a friend of mine until I got my car, and, and I kept seeing this girl, and I said, who is that? And he said, that's Ernie Noble, and I said, no, I went to school with Ernie Noble, and he said, well, that's his sister, Erna. They call her Ernie. I said, okay. So I, ha I happened to go to a dance. I was supposed to meet some girl at one of the high school dances, and uh, she was out front, and I started talking to her, and she kind of ignored me, but Later on, I saw her looking for me when we were inside, and I wound up taking five girls home, and she made sure she was the last one out, and uh, I just started dating after that. We dated for three years and then got married. I see. And uh, when did you get married? I got married in uh, November 27th, 1970. I see. And, uh, and children? I got two children. I got a son, Greg, 42, and I got a daughter, Jamie, 34. I see. Four grandchildren. I see. Um, and your friend Dusty that you kept talking about, was he home now also or did he? Yeah, we got we got together. In fact, he lived with me for a little bit. Uh, when I got out of the Army, I was staying with my mother and I had him in there. She wasn't happy about it, but we had two rooms upstairs. And I, even after I got married, he wound up staying with me for a while. And I got him involved in, in martial arts and um, he kind of got real into uh, the martial arts thing and, and rented an apartment from Bill Dimitri and, and actually later on wound up marrying uh, Bill's young, younger daughter, probably about 13, 14 years younger than Dusty. I see. And he, did, and he had some children also, didn't he? But, yeah, he had two, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah boy and a girl. Yeah. Um, what about the wound on your leg? Has it caused you problems since... Uh, um, you know, it, it, when I was younger, it never really seemed to bother me unless I would go out. I did a lot, a lot of lifting weights and running. And in fact, when I got on the police department, uh, I found out that you can't use a whole lot of martial arts. You can use some pressure points and you can use some locks, but you can't just beat the crap out of people. I don't care what people think about police. You just, I mean, I could have really hurt people if I really wanted to. You know, somebody give me a problem I'd poof, in the throat and they'd be gone. You can't do that, you know. So I got into lifting weights because it was more of a manhandling. Because most of the people that give you trouble is when you go to arrest them. And it's kind of like getting them in an arm lock and getting them down on the ground or against a cruiser and, and, and just using strength. So I got into lifting weights and uh, kind of got away from the martial arts. But um, I, I, if, if I'd go out and run like four or five miles, if I hadn't ran for a while, then my leg would really hurt me. Um, the last several years, uh, I find myself limping a lot. I know the doctor told me when I first got evaluated that I had a permanent limp. 
I find myself limping a lot in uh, certain times. I guess maybe if I get tired or something, you know. But I can show you with that. I mean, it's pretty easy to see. The bullet went in here. See this scar here? Yes. Okay, here's the bone. So if it hit the bone, it would have tore my leg right off. So this round part here is where the hole went in. It came out through here. Ah, yes. So I actually had a hole this big when it first hit. And they took the skin graft off here and put it in there. So that was kind of like. So even after 67, I still have this huge scar that everybody goes, what happened to your leg? And I'm like, well, I got shot. But, you know, there was 21 other dead people there, to, and I wasn't one of them. So right. I was pretty lucky. Yeah. Uh, and that didn't hinder you about getting on the police department? No. no. But, but I, like I said, I was in, doing martial arts. Yeah. I got back into martial arts. I really wanted to get back in 68, but I was afraid. I thought, somebody kicks me there, I'm gone. And I'd go down to the karate school three or four times a week and talk with Dimitri and talk with Barb. You know, his wife ran this school. She still does. Right. And it just, I, I just wanted to get back. So finally, I thought, I'm just going to do it, you know. So I'd wrap my leg. I'd put like a little thing around it. Uh, but it never caused me really too much trouble. But shoot, when I went in the police department, I was in great shape. I mean, I just made black belt. I made black belt in December '75, and, and and I got went on a police department in September '76. So, I see. That uh, is there. Um, but you know, if you think about me down on my knees, of course I had bent down, but I mean, how close that would be to my back or my chest? You know, mm -hmm. so I was just lucky. Yes, it was an AK-47. That's what the one of the machine gunners said that when they shot the guy out of the tree, he had an AK-47. And it was on full automatic because I saw the ground jump. And I mean, you see in a movie sometimes where the machine guns, they fire. Well, that's actually what I, what I saw. But it was like, as soon as I saw it, it was like, boom. I mean, it was that quick. I mean, I saw the ground jump in his back and my leg, it was within a split second that I saw all that. Now, your career on the police department, you uh, you eventually were promoted. And then you uh, tell us about your career on the police department. Uh, you worked. Went on as a patrolman. Just fell right into the job. I really liked it. Um, moved up through the ranks, sergeant, lieutenant, captain. Uh, retired as an assistant chief. Um, didn't care a whole lot for that job. It was too political and too administrative. I, I just always liked working the streets. In fact, we, I had turned that job down when I was a night captain because I, I could go anywhere I wanted at night and go on any call I wanted. I mean, I was getting, I was in my 50s, I was getting in foot pursuits. And uh, I just, I told the chief when he went to move me, he said, I'm gonna move all the captains. And I said, leave me on nights and I'll stay. I think I had 24 years. I said, I'll stay a full 30. He said, no, I gotta move the captains. And uh, so he put me in the crime bureau and the assistant chief left. Well, a year before that, I turned the job down. It was the same commission. So I thought, why not? I wasn't really political. And there was one guy that was, they thought for sure he would get the job, but I wound up getting it, so. Um, I really liked uh, this, being in patrol and being on the street and being a patrol commander as a captain more than I did any job. And then the SWAT team, I was on the SWAT team for 21 years. Um, we started our SWAT team in 78 and um, we had a captain that got the team started, Al Meyer, and, um, and I stayed on the team. Actually, when I was an assistant chief, I was a SWAT commander and I knew I had to give that job up because if something happened, I might have to help investigate it on, you know, on the administrative side. So I wound up giving that job up. And so when you retired, you retired to as assistant yeah, chief? Lieutenant Colonel, assistant chief, yeah. And w when did you retire? Uh, I retired September 27th, the same date I went on in uh, 2003. And then about four months later, I took a job running the Northern Kentucky Drug Strike Force. It was a four county drug unit, Campbell, Boone, Kenton, and Grant County. So I was, I think my title was the executive director. I see. So I did that for four years and, and uh, it was a good job. It was just, the officers came from other departments in the county. So they were kind of like lent to us for two years at a time. Some of them stayed longer than that. Uh, but our funding was, there, there's no funding. I mean, there's no tax base, like for police departments and sheriff's department, they have a tax base they get there's money from. Well, the strike force has no tax base. The, the, the county would give us some money 
and the state would give us a grant, which was a federal grant. But then the forfeitures were really down. At one time, forfeitures were great. I mean, shoot, the strike force had over a million dollars in forfeitures. Uh, the first year I ran the strike force, I had to spend three hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars less than they did the year before. So I just got fed up with the money issue. And I'd wake up at night and write stuff down at three o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, you know what? I'm making good money because I got my pension, I got this job, and I got a car I can go anywhere. But I said it's not worth it, you know. And and I turned sixty, and I thought, you know what? I'm not working anymore. So. Now, did you work uh, a lot with Bill Dimitri also on the oh, police yeah. department? One of the best officers I've ever worked with. Everybody thought he was a little, um, I don't know, overboard. Uh, I always, here's what I always thought about Bill Dimitri, now since you know him. Like, uh, he went to, he went to San, uh, Los Angeles, got up with Harvey Eubanks, who you know. And at that time, we're wearing white shirts and white hats. LA is wearing black shirts, black hats. So Dimitri comes back from the vacation, puts on the LA uniform and goes into the chief and said, this is the way we should be dressed. Chief kicked him out of the office. Two years later, we're wearing dark uniforms. Now, what does that tell you? Well, at that time, everybody goes, the guy's nuts. No, he's, he's not. He, it, if they put him in a, in a crime bureau, he changes everything. He changes all the paperwork and everybody's all upset about it. But later on, it's, it's good. I think he would have been a great chief. I really do, but he just politically he just wasn't in favor. And it, you know, if you're not politically in favor, you're not you don't have a shot at it. Right. But uh, he was a mentor to me and a, a great man. And just yes, he was. He talked me into going on the police department, the best job I ever had. And uh, I miss him every day. Yes. Yeah. You find out how really. Uh, Great, some people are, but only after they're gone. Man, I knew that before, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I was a young kid when I first took martial arts, and um, I was, you know, seventeen. And um, I remember basic training. I was, I was practicing. I think I, I think I was a yellow belt, not an orange belt. And uh, people say, "Oh, who was your instructor?" And I'd say, "Well, you know, the great Bill Dimitri. You know, they never heard of the guy." And uh, they said, "What's he look like?" I said, "Oh, man." Big broad shoulders, got these big arms, man, you know, strong and quick. I said, kick your kick your glasses off your face. You know, I mean that's how I saw it as a young seventeen year old kid. Sure. And I described that to the guys, you know. Yeah. Yes, I remember Bill well. Uh do you uh, Brian, do you have any questions that uh... did you do you have any guys in touch with any people when you were in the did I have what? Did you keep in touch with many people? And, you know, well, since like I started? said, I tried to after I got out, um, especially most of the guys that um, that I was in Vietnam with. And the, there's been about five that I actually got, got in contact with, and they just really don't want to talk about it. I even got hold of Lieutenant Vaughn. He was the, the, the lieutenant that took over when Captain McManus got shot. And he's the one who wrote me that letter and said, you shouldn't have been running out there where sergeants don't belong and different things like that. And he said, I'm sorry, but I've repressed all those memories and I've repressed it. I mean, he knew me. He said, I've repressed the good ones with the bad. In fact, he even said, well, you properly awarded for your actions. And I'm like, well, I got a purple heart, so I'm happy with that, you know. Um, but um, it's just, it's just, it's, and I actually recently got in touch with a guy I was an AIT with. <laughs> he doesn't remember me, so. And, and Dusty went to, he was in, we were, he lived in New York. Dusty went to his house at least three times and he doesn't, he doesn't remember him. I went to his house once, first time I'd ever was in New York in the 60s in Greenwich Village and everybody looked like the Beatles, you know. I got no hair, but it was kind of funny, I thought. And um, Dusty, you, you said that uh, Dusty and you were planning a trip when he, um... Yeah, he, we stayed in touch and, and he moved, got married and moved up to Westchester. And uh, we constantly talked to each other and we, we'd see each other every once in a while, not a whole lot because he was pretty busy and I was busy. And, and he had called me up and said, uh, let's do a backpacking trip. I said, okay. And um, talked about the Grand Canyon. And I said, that's fine. So he called me up one day and he said, well, I'm gonna come over and talk to you. So he come to the house and he goes, well, you can't go to Grand Canyon because in order to camp down there, you got to get a permit and they're three, three years getting a permit. 
He said, let's go out, let's go back to Europe, because he had went backpacking in Europe in the 60s. I said, okay. So he punched me in the stomach. He said, you better lose some weight. I don't want to be carrying your casket. Well, two weeks later, he was working out in his basement, and he had a stroke and died. In fact, when they called me, in fact, it was Barb Dimitri to call me because that was his, her son-in-law. And um, I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't come there. You know, I, I can't come there and see him there laying in a hospital bed with those needles. I, I can't do it. And tubes and stuff. And, and, and I, you know, I wish I would have went just for the family, but not went in the room, you know. Mm -hmm. But I carried his arm, and I, and I, I did his eulogy, and I, I still visit his grave twice a year. Yeah, and his children have done well, mm -hmm. and uh, the family's done well. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with friends like you and and Barb support, yeah, they've done quite well. I want to tell you, it's been a a real privilege and honor to sit here and talk with you, uh, Jim. And um, I just want to take this time to personally thank you for taking the time to talk with us and tell you. your story. And, and personally, thank you for your service to our country. You're, you're much admired and appreciated. Glad to meet an old karate cop. Thank you. <laughs>